I met it, him, the husband, two years ago. And I want to get sidetracked by the story of how I became, as the English call it, a mail order bride. That story is harrowing and depressing enough in itself. The war left a lot of orphans on both sides of the new border. Many have similar stories to mine. I don't want to waste however long I've got by sharing experiences that differ little from any other girl whose childhood died in the war. So many of us ended up press-ganged by hungry communities into going in the Russian men's vans. So many ended up here, or America, or Saudi Arabia, to share beds with disgusting men so families back home could keep coal in the furnace one more winter. A tale retold a thousand times over by every woman that's lived it. Their stories have nothing mine does not. Where my story differs is the ending. None of those other daughters of the war ended up with someone like the husband. This, I guarantee. It called itself Mr. Danforth. The first thing it said to me when I arrived at Heathrow was, You are called Mrs. Danforth. It wasn't a question. It was a command. Despite what you're thinking, this didn't raise suspicion. I'd had very few conversations with men that didn't start with them barking orders. My first thoughts of the husband were that he would be a man like all those except father. All I was thinking as he walked me to his SUV was, and so I go from the hands of one pig into the hands of another. How wrong I was. I didn't properly inspect the husband until I was in the back seat. I hadn't looked at him much in the airport. I'd kept my head down, staring at the floor, because that's what the Russian men told me to do. It took a few hours to reach the house. Plenty of time for me to stare at the husband in the rearview mirror, to get a proper look at the man whose bed I'd been sold into. That was when the alarm bell started ringing. As the SUV trundled down increasingly less maintained roads, my mind was running through possible explanations for my new husband's face. It was rigid, stiff. None of the muscle of his wide brow or angular jaw twitched, clenched, or moved. At all. For three whole hours. His skin was off, too. Not literally, but something about it troubled me for reasons I couldn't place. I think it was the tone. The hues of his face were too uniform, too smooth, almost the exact same shade of grey, almost peach all over. There was no ruddiness to his cheeks, no darkness under his eyes. For a man I'd been told was in his forties, he had none of the scars, laughter lines, or crow's feet I'd expected. His face had almost no crevices and creases at all. His eyes created a distrust I had no trouble explaining. They remained as still as his face throughout our silent journey. Even when we turned corners, his gaze remained locked straight ahead. I tried coughing once or twice to see if I could attract his attention. Nothing. Despite the unease this caused, I couldn't ignore that there was something to those eyes that is undeniably beautiful. Mesmerizing, even. Part of me wonders if that's why he, it, had no trouble enticing the unfortunate souls in the basement. The husband's eyes have a shimmer to them, a majestic light. That's the only way I can describe it. In my native Serbian, the word I'd use is sveti, but even that doesn't feel quite right. Everything in those pockets, from the unblemished whites to the smooth, perfectly circular pupils, sparkles like the rarest of ocean pearls. In any other context, that shine would be awe-inspiring, beautiful, wondrous. In the face of the husband, the man that doesn't blink, the enticing gleam has new undertones. In that face, the twinkling feels less like gazing at stars in distant galaxies and more like realising the light you've followed through murky waters is attached to a deep sea monstrosity. For three hours, we sat in silence. I actually jumped a little when the wheels ground to a halt. The husband didn't say anything. Not until he'd left the car and opened the passenger side door. This is Mr. and Mrs. Danforth's building. Follow. Now... The Russian men were safely a plain journey behind me. I allowed myself to pay more attention to the husband's words. 
I recognised immediately what I'd been too shell-shocked to notice before. He was speaking fluent Serbian. I mean fluent, too. His pronunciation was so perfect, he could easily have landed a job as a newsreader back home. This was a shock. I'd been implicitly told that he wouldn't speak Serbian, and almost no English people did. The Russian men loved to remind us of that. We all knew why. It made sure we knew we were alone that we were isolated, that if we tried to flee our new homes, nobody could understand enough to help. Isolated, Zabachen, in the language I knew. I couldn't think of a more fitting word for my new accommodation. The bungalow stood alone. For miles in every direction were nothing but fields of wilted and rotting vegetables. The muted grumble of motorway gridlock could be picked up when the wind blew the right way, but only on the absolute edges of my hearing. In a few spots on the horizon, I could see the amber haze of light pollution reflected on the underbellies of rolling clouds pregnant with rain. These telltale signs of civilization were distant, so distant that I knew if I ran, it would be days before I reached one. Inside, I found no respite for my clenched jaw or shallow breathing. There were... there are four rooms... The largest are the kitchen, dining area, and bedroom. Even they are pokey, though. The bedroom barely fits the cast iron bed I'm hiding under. The bathroom has full working amenities, which is something at least. The other room was the first item of discussion on the husband's agenda. The basement. Entry is strictly forbidden. He made the punishment for transgression clear, too. Not first, Mrs. Danforth. Can find more Mrs. Danforths. His warning sent a chill down my spine. After instructing me to cook us both a meal of baked beans, which he didn't eat, he commanded me to retire to bed. I didn't sleep at all that night. I lay in the dark, tears streaming down my face, listening to the creaking footsteps from the kitchen. Every time they'd clump closer to my door, my heart skipped a beat, breath catching in my throat. That moment I was expecting when I'd feel his weight sagging the mattress, hear the groan of the springs that signalled the initiation of the wifely duties he'd paid for, never came. This was a small relief, at least. In fact, by a week or two, I managed to sleep in relative peace for a few hours each night. Within a month, I only found I couldn't on the nights that, well, we'll get to that. Here's the thing. Until last night, I played by the rules. It's been two years, and I'm still Mrs. Danforth. There hasn't been a single day in that time the husband hasn't terrified me. However, he's never laid a hand on me, in any context. Two years is a long time. There have been nights when... God, I hate myself for this. I would have let him, just for something resembling human contact. The only bodies I've touched in two whole years were cold, clammy, and covered in loose soil. Other than that, I haven't had so much as a handshake. Not speaking to a real person for two years drives your mind to dark places, but touch starvation is a different madness entirely. If I ever make it out from under this bed, if I can make it through the rotting vegetables and find civilization beneath those ember clouds, I'm hugging the first person I see and never letting go. The first night was the blueprint for each that followed, my fear never subsided, but it did change. With every month, it became ever more tinted with hopelessness, a despairing melancholy. Tears have been a large part of my day. It was about six months into my marriage that the weight of it all broke me so much I couldn't stop them falling. It only took a week to realize I didn't need to conceal them from the husband. His smooth, motionless face never reacted to sobbing or anything else. I've tried screaming at him, insulting him, pleading, questioning, talking about insane nonsense even. Nothing. I must have retold my life story three dozen times to those gazeless shimmering eyes, yelled every curse, cracked every joke. Nothing. Aside from commands in stunted Serbian like, you will wake up now, and reading prevents mental degradation, you will read. He's never said a word to me. Every day has the same routine. He has me cook meals that he never eats, do menial cleaning tasks, and when he goes in the SUV to one of the patches of amber clouds, he instructs me to read. It's also my job to answer the door. 
This, I think, is the reason why he, why it, purchased my hand in marriage from the Russian men. Despite our isolation, there were many knockings. I was told on the first night that Mrs. Danforth's main role was ensuring that Mr. Danforth wasn't disturbed. That meant telling the various council workers, local political candidates, cold-calling salesmen, and preaching religious types that he was away on business. Always, he'd stand behind the door, just out of sight of the visitors, looking down at me with that rippling glow as I rattled off the textbook excuse. It went the same way every time. Well, almost every time. Sometimes, such as with the third visitor, the husband would intervene. I'm sure by this point you have wondered, are you telling me that for two years you've never tried to escape or stand up to him, even though he's never laid a hand on you? This question I understand, and it is one I can answer. As I said, the husband never laid a hand on me. The same can't be said for visitors to the house. I don't know what criteria it had for deciding which visitors became victims. All I know is that the third visitor, a poor boy barely out of his teenage years raising money for some cause or other, ticked the right boxes. Mr. Danforth isn't on a business trip. The husband's words rang out from the shadow behind the open door. He was speaking in English now, accent as clipped and precise in the British tongue as it had been in Serbian. He stepped out into the light, standing just behind me at the threshold of the shack. I'd barely been married to him a week, but already I knew him enough for this sudden change in behaviour to sound alarm bells. Mrs. Danforth was confused, the husband said. Please excuse her, she is not well. I gulped. So did the young man on the porch. He was trembling in his father's suit, a bead of sweat trickling down his forehead to pull at the crease of his brow. R r right yes, well, Mr. Danforth, the lad stammered, fumbling with his clipboard and pen. I'm here, um, I, I, I'm here to talk about... You will come inside Mr. Danforth's house. It wasn't a question. I stood in the doorway, trying my best to ignore the prickling chill of the husband's breath on the back of my neck. For a few drawn-out moments, I watched the boy's face twist into visible discomfort. In the end, his vulnerable mind couldn't win. I stood aside to let him slouch into the kitchen, wincing as the husband slammed the door behind him. Mrs. Danforth will go to sleep. Again. The husband's words weren't an inquiry. It was obvious they were addressed at me, if for no other reason than because he'd effortlessly switched to Serbian. But it's 2.30. The second set of Serbian words I heard came from my own lips. I blinked at the husband, perplexed at my own outburst, but nonetheless suddenly inspired. The mixture of confusion and defiance had me rooted to the spot. I said nothing further, but I still didn't move. Behind the husband, the trembling boy took a seat at the kitchen table. There were tears streaming down his face. I could tell that somewhere beyond those watering eyes was a voice. A voice screaming at the boy to get out of that chair and run. The boy's body wasn't listening. It had stopped listening the moment Mr. Danforth addressed it. All that body could do now was obey in a way that I found myself for the first time not doing. The reason it took two years to work up the courage to be under this bed is because of how the husband reacted to my first, and only, flirtation with disobedience. I was expecting him to raise his fists, to fly across the room in a fit of fury to beat me back into submissiveness. The moment never came. As I said, he's never laid a hand on me. He doesn't have to. I felt the sharp stab at the base of my skull the instant his eyes narrowed. Before I had time to fully register its existence, the pain had spread across my entire hand, drowning every nerve in acidic burning agony. My nails were digging into my scalp around the moment I noticed I was screaming. Through the white and black spots peppering my vision, I could see the husband standing over me. The change in perspective was the only reason I knew I'd collapsed. For the first time since meeting him, his expression had changed. He wasn't staring blankly ahead anymore. He was glaring. His eyes were thin slits allowing only slithers of their intense, otherworldly iridescence through. The beams went pointing directly ahead, but down at the floor. 
down at me. Lips that had only so far moved to form words were crunched into a scowl. The muscles in his jaw bulged so much that I'm amazed his near-perfect teeth didn't crack under the pressure. That was the moment I first understood the depth of my true fear of this man. This thing. It was when I was writhing in unexplainable agony, seeing him tower over me in his ironed polo shirt and jeans. Seeing him notice me for the first time. It's that fear which has kept me docile and trembling for two long years. And it was there on those freshly scrubbed tiles that I cowered before it for the first time. When the husband spoke again, it was through clenched teeth. Mrs. Danforth will go to sleep. Y yeah, yes. Once more I heard words leave my lips. The instant they did, my head was released from the invisible barrage of fire. The husband relaxed back into his usual blank slate state. I couldn't bring myself to look over my shoulder as I crawled to the bedroom door. I caught a quick glance while I pulled myself up to my trembling feet using the handle though. Brief, accidental, but enough to paint a clear picture for the darkest places my wandering mind can go in the quiet hours. The husband had turned his back to me. He was facing the kitchen table, standing over the acne-scarred young man. The boy hadn't said a word throughout my ordeal. One look at his face told me why. He was as terrified as I was. Enough tears had fallen from his cheeks that a small puddle formed on the tabletop. He was doing his best to stare straight ahead, but every so often he'd be unable to stop his gaze flicking to meet the husband. Whenever their eyes met, he'd let out a soft whimper. One of his legs broke out into violent judders as I closed the door behind me. I curled up under the threadbare duvet, willing myself to forget the nauseating thought that the spasms were from a trapped mind resisting induced paralysis. Lying awake with tears in my eyes was the norm. That night, the reason I had to bite down on my hand to muffle my cries was new though. The sounds that snaked and writhed through the cracks around that door were... What's the best way to convey it? Haunting? Yes. Haunting. I can't think of a better word, actually. They lived on as earworms for many months after. Spectres that teased explanation for the thuds and scrapes in the nights that followed from the worst depths of my imagination. The scream started as soon as the bedclothes were over my head. High-pitched. Ragged. Screams I knew all too well from hiding in my parents' closet during the war, feeling relieved that the men with their AK-47s had chosen the family next door. It was no relief hearing screams like that now. Even worse when they changed to the other kind of screaming I recognised. The kind I'd also heard in my parents' closet. The kind my father did when the men with AK-47s hadn't chosen a family next door or down the street. The kind he'd made when they'd beaten him senseless, tied him to a chair, and taken out their box of DIY tools. Hearing a barely grown man's howls of torment is harrowing enough. Were I a lucky woman, that would have been all I heard. Such as it is, luck has never been in my favour. The wet slurps of flesh tearing, muted snaps as bones cracked, the tightening of eardrums when the drill whirred into life. None of the sounds I associated with screams like that were present. Instead, there were noises that nothing in my memory could reconcile. It started with clicking, a prolonged barrage of even faster skittering like ball bearings bouncing off a car windshield. The boy was babbling something when they ended, but his words were muffled by the thick wood of the door. His terror wasn't. Once the clicks fell silent, the second unexplained noise started. This was humming. A deep, electronic, unwavering thrum that even through the door I could tell came from machinery. Within 20 seconds it ceased. Abruptly, and without indication, the exact moment the lad's wailing grew from panic-induced to pained. The unexplained noises the ones coming from whatever it was the husband was doing, had also taken a turn. There was a... 
I don't know what to call it, like a whistling? A shrill, continuous note, breathy, but definitely not organic. It was far too monotonous and unbending for that. There was a metallic tint to it too. Something I can't quite put into words, but nevertheless conjured visions of rusted piped and creaking gears. This continued for a full 15 minutes, long after the screaming from the young man fell silent. My teeth were clamped on my hand with such pressure that I tasted blood by the time it ended. I waited at least an hour until the thump, thump, thump of something heavy being dragged down to the basement had ceased. I fell asleep shaking as I always did, although harder than I had since the war. The husband said nothing of the previous night when he woke me to cook a breakfast he once again didn't eat. My instruction for that day was simple. Mrs. Danforth will clean. I could see why, as soon as I left the bathroom, the young man's chair sat at the epicenter of an explosion of dark red stains. Stains that sprayed out from a specific point. When I realised that point was roughly where the boy's head would have been, I couldn't stop myself from breaking down into uncontrolled sobs. These continued throughout cooking the requested porridge, and through the silent meal. The memory of what happened when he... When it stared at me, when it started boiling my brain with nothing but a glare, was the only reason I could finish the meal as instructed. Every mouthful took willpower to prevent returning once swallowed. This has been perhaps one of the hardest conditions of my situation to endure. There are only two places at the kitchen table, and the one the husband chooses for his guests isn't the one he sits at to not eat. I'm not instructed to clean until after breakfast. The husband does this deliberately, I think. The message is clear. Look at the blood you sit in. There were other Mrs. Danforths. These nights happen at least once every two weeks, although it can sometimes be more. Highest frequency was four in as many days. After a while, I couldn't help but start asking questions. I did try fielding them directly to him, which received the same response as every other interaction I've tried to initiate. Since that got me nowhere, I was left to muse, hypothesize, and, when I could stomach it, listen. After two years of this, I still had no clue what he was doing or why he was doing it. The why I can still only guess. I found out the what last night, but we'll cover that. I've got to tell you about the phone in the basement first. It was yesterday, and one of those mornings that I sat in a six-foot scab. The husband had not long ventured out to one of the distant amber hazes to purchase food he would never eat. I was scrubbing the red stains left by an unfortunate fundraiser for endangered pandas when, dangling almost out of earshot, I heard it. It was coming from the basement oozing up through the cracks beneath the sponge and soap suds. I thought it was a bell at first, or a wind chime. Then the buzzing started. It had been so long since I heard one that I almost didn't recognise it. It was a phone ringing. My heart skipped several beats. I had to manually restart my breaths, refusing to believe what my ears were telling me. A quick glance at the window was all the reassurance I needed. The husband had only just left. He was always gone for at least two hours. I had time. Hand shaking, I put down the sponge. Checking the mouldy fields one last time, the memory of that mind stab glare still fresh despite two years passing, I gulped. Every step took more willpower than I think you'd ever believe, but I stopped following my instructions. Instead, I walked towards the basement door. It amazes me still that it wasn't locked this entire time. I guess he doesn't care about any Mrs. Danforth's discovering his secrets. Although, why would he if he can just replace us? The smell hit me first. It rolled out the doorway the second I cracked it ajar. Pungent. Acrid. Heavy. And with a sweetness that brings no comfort. Once more in my mind I was a little girl in the war, 
finally daring to leave my home after three days staring at my father's glassy, unmoving eyes through the gap in the closet door. In the basement, I was fortunate enough that the angle of the sun through the kitchen window hit the doorway just enough to provide some light. Enough to see that there'd been dozens of air fresheners of every conceivable shape, scent and size nailed to the ceiling. This at least explained why the cloying stench of human decay hadn't reached the kitchen. There was a small vent in one corner, but I knew this alone wouldn't have been enough to mask the smell of all those corpses. There were dozens of them, a mass of bodies heaped in the far corner that spread almost to the stairs. I recognised all of them, despite the varying stages of decay, every single one, from the near skeletal postman through to the bloated purifying lost hiker that picked the wrong place to ask for directions. This I expect is no surprise though, it wasn't to me. Recognising those bodies wasn't why I collapsed into a wailing mess at the foot of the basement stairs. It was the machine down here with them. In the opposite corner, underneath the feeble ventilation shaft, was an oven. Not a small one like the pathetic thing in the kitchen. This was an industrial unit, the kind of furnace found in morgues and crematoriums. It was the implication more than anything. The oven had clearly been there for a while, judging by the rust and soot. He hadn't been bluffing about the other Mrs. Danforths. The presence of that furnace confirmed two things. The husband had been at this since long before I arrived, and that he's had to make no effort to conceal his activities. Either nobody's tried to stop him, or nobody can. I'm praying it's the former. The phone restarting its jingle snapped me out of my despair. My stomach dropped when I pinpointed the source. No, I thought. No, 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 please, anything but this. It only took one blink for the basement to vanish. I was back in the war, reaching for the keys in my father's pocket so I could leave our flat and find food. Screaming as his cold, stiff form fell on top of me from the bed, wailing for help that wasn't there as I struggled to free myself from underneath the dead weight of a man four times my size. No, snap out of it. I swallowed, deciding to obey the inner defiance, finding encouragement in yet another buzzing tinkle from within the pile. I had to beat back the intrusive memories every second my arm was in that heap of decaying flesh. I was only feeling my way through clammy limbs and blood-crushed fabric for about 30 seconds, but my perception managed to stretch them to decades. The feeling of slick, waxy skin on my arm, the noxious tang of rotting human meat mere inches from my nostrils, the moist groans and creaks as I disturbed built-up gases and fluids inside bloated organs. All of it merged into a sensory overload, I'm still amazed I managed to push through, when my hand wrapped around something hard, plastic, and vibrating. I couldn't pull it out fast enough. I didn't stop to look at my prize until I was certain I was back in the bedroom and not having some kind of fever dream. The phone, this phone, had 50% charge remaining. I turned it off immediately, not wanting to waste one second of precious battery life. But where to hide it? The solution seemed so stupid I caught myself laughing for the first time in, well, long enough that I'm getting tearful trying to work it out. A while. The one place in the house the husband has never been, aside from the bathroom which offered no hiding spaces. I heard the crunch of tyres on dirt at the same time I finished rearranging the pillow to make triply sure there was no indication of the treasure stuffed inside. I'm quite impressed with my quick thinking for this next part. Obviously, I'd not done the cleaning as instructed. I need an excuse, something that wouldn't arouse suspicion. So, what did I do? I lay on the ground in the unwashed blood and claimed I'd passed out. The husband queried and I fed it a whole yarn about collapsing on the floor and having no idea how much time has passed. It worked. He instructed me to cook and consume chicken soup, and then continue with the cleaning as instructed. 
The day became one of the longest of my two year hell. For the first time, I had to force crying, moroseness, defeat. I couldn't remember when I'd last had reason to smile. And now, I was willing my lips not to curl upward. All I could think about was this phone, this message. I can barely speak any English. Phoning the police is pointless. I can't explain where I am, let alone what's happening. Writing it though? I've had two years with no mental stimulation besides reading classic literature with the assistance of an English-Serbian dictionary. I was mentally planning this message all yesterday afternoon. I didn't anticipate writing it so soon, but a lot's changed since I found this phone. Last night was one of those nights, you see. This one was a woman, older than me by several decades, meeting constituents on behalf of some local politician. The scene played out the same as it always did. Mrs. Danforth will go to sleep. I didn't protest. The woman was doing the standard paralysis panic dance when I shut the door behind me. As usual, I did my best to avoid her face, to spare myself the mental image of the terrified, pleading look they always had in their eyes. Once more, I was laying under the bedclothes. I could feel the coolness of the phone in my palm when the whimpers and screams started. The perfect cover to start writing, right? I'd wish I'd thought so. Instead, for some reason, the reminder of my successful venture into the basement emboldened me. I found myself not hurriedly sending out an SOS to anyone on the internet that could help, but instead creeping back towards the door. I needed to know, you see. I'd never be able to put this behind me if I didn't know. Idiot. Once more, the pressure of teeth on my palm drew blood. Through the crack in the door, I saw. I saw everything. Immediately I regretted my decision, but so powerful was the morbid curiosity cultivated over two long years that I couldn't look away. By last night, I already had incredibly strong suspicions about the husband. That he was probably better referred to as it. The nightmare playing out in front of me confirmed every single one of them. Both the husband and the woman were sitting at the kitchen table, exactly as he and I did for every meal he didn't eat. She was still ensnared by whatever kept his victims docile and obedient. She'd managed to wrestle back just enough control to start screaming, for one of her hands to occasionally spasm and flap on the laminate tabletop, but that's it. For his part, the husband was moving the most he ever had in our two-year marriage. I now knew what the clicking sounds were. Already, the urge to scream was so much I felt lightheaded, and he... it... They were only just getting warmed up. There were hundreds of them, miniature clockwork men of varying proportions and sizes, the largest of which stood barely over two inches tall. They were pouring out of the husband's slack open jaw. Some rappelled down on ropes made of string and twine, others opted to free fall. The clicking I'd heard on every one of those nights? It was the sound of them hitting the table of uncountable pairs of tiny brass feet scurrying around on the laminate. They moved fast, so fast that some were barely a blur. The larger ones pointed and directed the runts of the horde, ushering them to their assigned tasks with cracks of spark-tipped prods no longer than a toothpick. Each knew their role. It took them almost no time at all to set up the shoebox-sized machine they dragged out of the husband's open chest cavity. The husband's response to all of this? The same as his responses to everything else. There was no reaction to the sea of copper and bronze cascading from his wide moor. He didn't flinch when some of them clambered up his shirt to unbutton it, when they pulled seams on his hairless chest to peel back that rubbery skin. As his innards were revealed inch by inch, he didn't even blink. Why? Because he didn't exist. It, the husband, was just a shell. A vessel for this mass of clanking mechanical activity to travel amongst us undetected. His iron rib cage held no organs. There was no beating heart. No rising and falling lungs. No gurgling stomach. Behind it lay nothing save for a large pearlescent blue steel box. As I watched, eyes welling with tears, 
Some of the clockwork men started pulling levers and crank handles set into the husband's spine. There was a faint whoosh of unseen steam valves as the miniature locking mechanisms holding the blue steel box in place released. It landed with a heavy thud where the writhing heap of cogs and gears was thickest. To my amazement, none of the rusted figures were crushed. Instead, there was a flurry of skittering metallic limbs. Then, much like a dead tarantula carried by ravenous ants, the box glided toward the trembling woman. That's when I learned the source of the second sound, the unwavering motor-like humming. It came from the array of pistons, gears, and other pneumatic components hidden behind the husband's face. While some of the clockwork throng got to adjusting the knobs and dials on the blue steel box, the husband's head was opening. A great split ran vertically along its centre, rising from his chin like he was being unzipped from within. The whirring started when the segment started rising up and outward on the arrangement of intricate pneumatic extenders. Those eyes that barely moved? They were lenses. Thick, one-way lenses so that the thing sitting within, the source of that mesmerising, paralysis-inducing glow, could view the outside world. I've never seen something be so ugly and beautiful at once. The body was grotesque, an aberration that went against everything sane and decent. It was barely 12 inches long, and most of its mass lay in its bulbous body. The quivering yellowish belly pulsated in a small metal chair that emerged from the husband's open throat. Around it was dozens of wheels, switches, levers, and valves. The aberration manipulated these with its seven wiry arms. These thin appendages wormed their way from the creature's neck, moving and flicking like reptilian tongues around the maddeningly complex interface. Above the ring of purplish tendrils were two gnarled horns protruding from behind its tiny collarbone. These were thicker than the tentacle arms and half as short. They weren't mobile either. The dark flesh of their surface seemed scarred, burned. Open sores on its surface wept a whitish liquid I could smell as soon as the face segments drifted apart. A rancid smell. A smell far too close to the cloying miasma in the basement. Between those sore-crusted stumps, though, what hovered between them was... sweaty, holy... There's no other word. It was the light. An orb of it. Floating between the bony horns. I can't tell you what colour it was because it was all of them. Not in the way that white is all colours of light either. Your brain registers white light as white. My brain was registering the orb as white. Black. Red. Yellow. Green. Purple. Every colour I can name simultaneously. And even some that I can't. Exposed to the world, it was bright. Almost blindingly so. If I hadn't spent my nights under blankets facing the wall, I'd have noticed it flashing through the cracks between floor and door. The orb was no larger than a chicken's egg. Somehow, the moment I saw it, I knew its truths. That it was a sentient. Aware. That it and the phlegm-coated blight beneath were one. The instantaneous awareness of the power of the thing was overwhelming. My tears flowed more freely than they ever had, even during the war. I was only in its presence a few minutes, but during that time all cognitive freedom left me. My sense of time, place, self, all gone. There was nothing except the light. The woman's screech snapped me out of my awe. A wave of nausea welled up to my throat. It was obvious why she was screaming, and it took everything in my power not to scream too. The brass army had finished setting up the blue steel box. The woman was screaming because two sharp needles, each about a foot and a half long, had launched themselves from the machine on the table. They'd found the corners of her eyes. She wasn't crying tears now, but rivers of dark red. The chrome needles drilled through her tear ducts, deep into her sockets, tearing through bone and optical nerves. I knew exactly what they were trying to find. I'd read enough classics with medical protagonists to recognise lobotomies. What I'd never read about were the apparitions. The whistling sound was... well, I don't know what it was. All I know is that it started the moment those needles began to glow red hot. A small crystal had risen from a port at the box's centre. 
It too shone with a crimson heat. Above the fist-sized rock was a constantly shifting horde of spectral figures. Only one of them I recognised. The woman in the chair. The one whose eyes were rolling back in her skull. It didn't take me long to put the pieces together. I was seeing her life. A montage of ghostly scenes from her past, pulled from her brain to be displayed and dissected by the aberration in the husband's head. It was leaning forward in its chair, the seven worm arms quivering excitedly. I could tell it was searching for something, that there was some vision the glowing orb was hoping to witness. I had no idea what, and still don't. I don't want to find out either. Whatever it was, the glowing orb didn't find it in this particular set of memories. I could sense the frustration ebbing from it when the husband's face began to react. I almost tore a ligament in my hand when the needles retracted. They left the woman's head with a snap. Such force was there that her head wrenched back with an audible crack as vertebrae in her neck split. A wide cone of blood and cranial fluid sprayed from the wounds covering the table while the last beats of life twitched out of her body. So yeah, that was last night. The night I found out, he, it, they didn't notice me watching. The orb-headed aberration or his clockwork minions. This morning was the same as all the others. That is until they left to get the food they had no reason to consume. Right now, they are grabbing the keys to the SUV to drive after me. They think I've run off into the wood fields and bushes in front of the house. That's because I spent half an hour running in said direction. But, you see, I then spent another half an hour running backwards. By the time they figured it out, I'll have run off into the fields behind the house. The ones with the brightest amber in the clouds, where the roar of motorway life comes loudest. I deliberately left the door open and did everything I could to make it look like I'd already run. Thank God it worked. While I was writing this, they were in a rage, tearing about the kitchen and smashing everything they could find. Thanks for providing enough distraction to keep my breathing steady and quiet. Whatever they are, they don't understand people enough to check under a bed. They are driving off now, so I've got to give it two minutes, then run as fast as I damn can toward those clouds. I'm turning this phone off. 20% battery. I may need it. I'll send an update when, who am I kidding, if I make it. In the meantime, if the place I'm describing seems familiar, my warning is this. Stay the hell away. Whatever they are, they don't have to be shy. They want you to come looking. I've never had a choice in where life takes me. You do. Don't waste it. Thank you guys, ghouls and girls for watching. Please feel free to connect with me on my Discord server, and if you want to watch me live, check out my Twitch channel. I am very active on both platforms and even have scheduled streams. I would absolutely love to see you there. Links to my other social media platforms are in the description below. Stay, 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 stay.